I am presenting Union Gospel Presses Sunday School Lesson Number 3, Sunday, December 20, 2020. Merry Christmas. The lesson is entitled, The Word Became Flesh. Lesson text comes from John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Related scriptures are Luke 2, 1 through 14, Colossians 1, 16 through 20, Genesis 1, 1 through 5, Hebrews 1, 1 through 4, Philippians 2, 6 through 11. The place is unknown. The time is eternity past. As we continue our series of lessons in the Gospel of John, we now find ourselves considering the marvelous reality that the Word became flesh. As we study John 1, 1 through 14 during this Christmas season, we will consider both Jesus' entrance into this world as well as his rejection by his own people. Today's aim, facts, to note the eternal nature of Jesus. Principle, to, to praise the Lord for Jesus' incarnation, which is the real reason to celebrate Christmas. Application, to correctly proclaim the biblical Jesus as recorded in John 1, 1 through 14, to the loss of our current generation. Illustrating the lesson, John 1, 1 through 14 can be experienced visually by sitting in a dark room with the unlit candle. While sitting in the dark, it is easy to realize our limitations. We can't see our surroundings. We can't perceive where we are. We can't even move around without risking injury. But when that candle is lit, so much changes. With the illumination that is brought forth, we can see our surroundings. We can locate ourselves. We can move forward without stumbling. In our passage today, we see how Jesus served as the light for this very dark world. And as the light of God, Jesus points the way toward God and life in him. But it is possible to reject or flee the light of Jesus. Those who reject him remain in darkness, loss, and helpless. Practical points. One, Jesus Christ is God and has always been God. John 1, 1 through 2. Two, as God, Jesus is the creator and the one who gives life to people, verses 3 through 5. Three, like John, we should bear witness to Christ, reflecting him to the world, verses 6 through 8. Four, mankind's only hope is in the truth that Jesus Christ, the true light, has come into the world, verse 9. Five, those who receive Jesus' gift of salvation are born again as children of God. Verses 10 through 13. Six, it is through Jesus that we know God and see his glory. Verse 14. Golden text. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. John 1, 10. Today we have three lesson outlines. The first is the word, coming from John 1, 1 through 5. The second is the light, John 1, 6 through 13. The third is the incarnation, John 1, 14. Introduction. John's presentation of Jesus is so unique that some Bible scholars have had problems with it. The synoptics concentrate on Jesus as a historical figure, but John emphasizes his deity. John's unique purpose accounted for his selection of material, as was true of every biblical writer. He omitted gene Jesus' genealogy, birth, baptism, temptation, exercising demons, parables, transfiguration, institution of the Lord's Supper, agony in, Geth in Gethsemane, and ascension. He focused on Jesus' ministry in Jerusalem, the Jewish feasts, Jesus' private conversations with individuals, and his preparation of his disciples. John's emphasis can also be seen in how much he repeatedly stresses the importance of believing in Jesus. The word believe is found 85 times in this gospel. To further stress how important belief in Jesus is, John includes seven signs and seven and I am stated that emphasis Christ's deity. The Word, John 1, 1. 
in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and God, and the Word was God. Verse 2. The same was in the beginning with God. Verse 3. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Verse 5. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The Creator. John 1, 1 through 3. Three important theological truths are included in John's opening statement. If we read verse 1 with a certain emphasis, these truths become obvious. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We then see Jesus' pre-existence, his distinct personhood from the Father, and his deity. He existed before time began and was living as a distinct person from the Father and the Holy Spirit. But he nevertheless is one of the same divine essence as the Father and the Spirit. The, the Greek word, the Greek for word is logos. The Greeks in John's day understood this to mean reason or idea. This included the idea of the ultimate personal intelligence behind the universe. The ancient rabbis used the, Greek, the Hebrew equivalent for logos to refer to God in their contemporaries on the Old Testament because of their emphasis on Yahweh as the God who speaks. They also thought of God's word as the agent of creation and the one through whom his messages came to Moses and the prophets. John's purpose in the use of Logos was to reach both Greeks and Jews with the truth about Jesus. He wanted their established understanding of the term to lead them to understanding the truths presented in his opening statements. His emphasis on plurality within the Godhead can be seen in the structure of verse 2. Genesis 1.1 says, God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. But John declares here that God did all his creative work through his son, the word. Colossians 1.16 states that by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether there be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. The author of Hebrews writes that it was Jesus by whom also he made the world, one, two. Nothing in the universe was created apart from Jesus' creative agency. Life and light, John 14, John 1, 4 through 5. In the statement, in him was life, in verse 4, we see a distinct difference from the previous statements about creation. God is the source of all life, John 5, 26 says. For as the Father have life in himself, so have he given to the Son to have life in himself. As such, we must acknowledge that all of us are dependent on God for every moment of our existence, both in this life and in the life to come. In Greek usage, the word life in John's day was commonly understood as referring to that unique attribute possessed by all living creatures. But John, along with the other New Testament authors, regularly uses the word to specifically indicate eternal, divine life. They make it clear, however, that such life is experienced only by those who believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior. The life found in Jesus is that which delivers individuals from the darkness of sin. That is why it is also referred to as the light of men. It implies deliverance from spiritual darkness to spiritual light. Spiritual darkness is separation from God, the state of being spiritually dead in sin under the righteous wrath of Almighty God, 326, 336, Ephesians 2, 1, Colossians 3, 6. Spiritual light refers to spiritual understanding and insight, and it is totally absent from unbelievers. Darkness cannot comprehend what spiritual light has to offer. Jesus is the source of that light. But because of the spiritual darkness that is present everywhere, he is rejected by the majority of humanity. The light, verse 6. 
there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Verse 7. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. Verse 8. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Verse 9. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Verse 11. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Verse 13. Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Witness, John 1, 6 through 7. John, the author of the gospel, now introduces another man named John as the herald of the coming light. John the Baptist was specifically sent by God to bear testimony to the person referred to as the light. Although Luke's gospel contains more biographical information about John the Baptist, John's gospel emphasizes his divine mention and purpose. It is another example that shows John's emphasis on Jesus as the Son of God and Savior of the world. John the Baptist came to serve as a witness to the one coming after him, rather than to be an individual known for his own exploits and, tri and, and triumphs. The Greek word for witness in verse 7 can be found 27 times in this gospel. It is the source of our English word martyr which is a title given to those Christians who have died in their service to Christ. In Greek, it means to solemnly testify in a legal sense and also was a title given to prophets. John's ministry was to declare and prepare for the coming of the Son of God, Jesus, the light of the world. It was his specific mission to call people to repentance from sin and to submit to the sign of baptism. John's testimony broke a nearly 400-year prophetic silence since the days of Malachi. From Malachi's last prophecy until John the Baptist, there had been no specific word or revelation from God. Now this, this rather strange-looking fellow appeared in fulfillment of a prophecy by Isaiah, Isaiah 41 through 8, Luke 3, 3 through 6. If people believed his testimony about the coming light, they would be ready to receive the light they so desperately needed, not the light. John 1, 8 through 9. John the Baptist was not the light the world needed. He was there to point people to the real light. This does not diminish his own greatness and importance, for Jesus himself later said of John, But what went ye out for to see? A prophet. Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet, Luke 7, 26. He also said, Among those that are born of a woman, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, verse 28. As great as the ministry of announcing the coming of Messiah was, it paled in comparison to the ministry of the true light of the world in providing eternal salvation for humanity. That is no doubt why John is careful to inform his readers that John the Baptist was not the anticipated light of the world, but merely the one who would testify to him. Only the true light is able to provide spiritual understanding for all people. Only Jesus is entitled to be the object of our faith. He is the one who determines where people are in their relationship with God. Only those who repent of their sins and believe in him will actually receive the saving light that he bestows. With the 400-year prophetic silence broken, God began a new thing on the earth. Redemption was now going to be open to everyone, both Jew and Gentile. Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. And this redemption includes the absolute and complete forgiveness of sins and eternal life in the presence of Almighty God. Rejection, John 1, 10 through 11. In verse 10, we find the profound truth expressed in three statements. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. 
Theologically, we see the doctrines of Christ's incarnation, Christ's role as a creator, and Christ's rejection of rejection all in one sentence. It was his incarnation that brought him to live in the world he had created. John's gospel makes a definitive declaration about these truths in verse 12 through 14. What an ironic statement verse 10 is. Jesus came to live in the very world he created, but that world did not know him. He was rejected by his own creation. The people living in the world he created did not recognize him as their very creator living among them. To most of them, he was nobody special. No, he was nobody special of noteworthy at all. Isaiah 53, 2 to 3. J John uses the words his own twice in verse 11. In the first occurrence, he refers to Jesus as coming to his own creation. But in the second, he refers to Jesus as coming to his own people, the Jews. Even though he was living among his own creations, they could not recognize him because of their corruption by sin due to the fall of creation through Adam and Eve. At that time, the human mind became spiritually darkened and has become progressively darker down to today. Thus, even though the same divine light shines in the darkness of this world, people are trapped in their spiritual blindness and cannot comprehend it without the working of the Holy Spirit. Sons of God, John 1, 12-13. Even though the majority of people did not recognize Jesus for who he is, there were individuals who believed in him. While most of his own people ignored or rejected him, some are said to have received him and thereby were given the power to become children of God. As opposed to the many who rejected Jesus, these few welcomed him. They are described as those who believed on his name. The experience of the Apostle Paul with the jailer at Philippi is a prime illustration, Acts 16, 26-31. When an earthquake shook the foundations of the prison where Paul and Silas were being held, the prison doors flew open. The jailer was about to commit suicide because his life was forfeit if any of his prisoners escaped. But Paul called out to him. The jailer was under such deep conviction that he fell down before Paul and Silas, asking how he could be saved. Their answer was, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. John's Gospel states in one thirteen that the birth of, of these children of God is not by blood, physical birth, or the will of the flesh, sexual desire, or from the will of man, any human volition. This spiritual body is vastly different from any corporeal one. It is, from start to finish, a divinely wrought spiritual birth, and it is essential for redemption and eternal life in heaven. No human endeavor can place us into God's family, but faith in the Son of God does indeed. The change involved is referred to in Scripture as the new birth, being born again or being saved. John 3.3, 3, 7, 17, 10, 9, 1 Peter 1.23, Acts 2.21, 16, 30-31, Romans 10.9. It happens by the grace of God. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8-9. through 9. The Apostle Peter, in writing to churches under his spiritual care, spoke of the new birth this way. Ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unframed love of the brethren being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. 1 Peter 1, 22-23. The Incarnation, verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Until this point, the word has been spoken of in abstract and general terms. But now it is specifically stated that the word became flesh, a statement that is surely one of the most important in the entire Bible. 
The human mind cannot fully grasp the wonder of the eternal word taking on human nature, but that is exactly what is declared here. Jesus took on full humanity without sin and lived among the people of earth. In the early years of the Christian church, there was a teaching called Doxitism that claimed Jesus never actually took on a human body and nature. It is merely an illusion. The teaching of John's gospel is clear and unequivocal. The eternal word of God took on a real human body of flesh and bone, and he lived as truly human among his people. There is a theological teaching that explains how this worked, and it has an imposing name, hypostat hypostatic union. This doctrine affirms that the truth that Jesus had two hypostasis natures combined in one unified person. When he took on human flesh, he became 100% human. That is perfect and complete as a human being, but without sin. At the same time, his deity is undiminished. He is also 100% divine. In Jesus Christ, deity and humanity are perfectly combined without mixing them, separating them, diminishing them, or changing them in any way. The result is the God-man, a person who two complete uncomplicated natures, unconflicted natures, the word became flesh. Questions. One. What three theological truths are contained in the opening statement of John's gospel? Two, how was John's use of logos an attempt to reach both Jews and Greeks? Three, how do we reconcile John's teaching that Jesus is the creator with what we read in Genesis 1-1? Four, how did John connect life and light in Jesus and what happened when that light meant darkness? Five, what was John the Baptist's divine calling? Six, what can the true light do that John the Baptist was never meant to? Seven, what three theological truths are contained in John 1.10? Eight, explain the two uses of his own in verse 11. Nine, what did John say about the people who did not reject Jesus? Ten, what is meant by the doctrine of the hypostatic union? This concludes the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, December 20, 2020. Thank you for listening. God bless.